Just in time for the Monday Town Hall, we are live from the Two Rivers Mall. Today we are having a very serious discussion on waiting on health and also the cancer epidemic. Many suggestions that it should be declared a national disaster and for good reason. In 2018, a WHO research shows that 32,987 people died of cancer. The following year, there was 47,887 new cases. Tonight, we have some of the cancer survivors with us, but also the country's mourning the death of Bomet Governor, Her Excellency Joyce Laboso. I want to introduce my guests, beginning from my immediate right. Thank you so much for making time, Honorable Sabina Shege, Moranga Women Rep, and also Health Committee Chairperson of the National Assembly, Asante Sana, Dr. Mwashonda Chibanzi. KMPDU Deputy Secretary General, Asante for making time as well, and Dr. Njoki Wamai, an Assistant Professor at USIU, Asante for making time. We are still waiting for Dr. Catherine Nyongesa. She's an oncologist and also a founder of the Texas Cancer Center. She'll be telling us why it is so expensive to treat cancer and what more should be done. Mashirima Kapombe is also with me. We'll be crossing over to her as well in just a bit. But first, Honorable Sheg, I'd like to start with you. Just condolence and what you think this whether this should now be declared a national disaster uh, thank you very much and good evening um, I'll first and foremost start with giving my condolences to the family of Dr. Joyce Laboso the people of Bomet um, and Kenyans at large it's just um, a few days ago that we also lost Honorable Kenoko so I'll also like to take an, uh, this opportunity also to give my condolences to the family of Kenoko and uh, the people of Kibra constituency. And yes, as you said, um, cancer should be declared a disaster in this nation. And I think it just should be addressed now from the office of the president directly. And um, looking from where we came from with HIV and the way it was taken to the doorstep of the presidency and the seriousness was taken, we need really to take cancer uh, with a lot of seriousness, starting from the training, awareness we just need to go to the grassroots and just create awareness we have to focus um, from starting from the community health workers going all the way and i think where we are as a nation it's not just about the equipment or the hospitals that we have but we must go and talk to our people from nutrition from just going for checkups yes. you know and just creating awareness that's what we need to do okay. and i just want to just say, might be for the leaders who have just left us, and especially somebody like Honorable Kenoko, who went out and actually said, I'm suffering from cancer. That's a very bold step that we have not seen it before, so that people, we saw so Bob talking yeah. about it, then people can start having this conversation. And I'm hoping from where I see it also, that we are going to look at legislation from training. Yeah. Uh, tomorrow we are going to have a conversation with the institutions and asking ourselves what are we training our students on, where are the gaps and how are we addressing the gaps. And I think it's, this is something that as a nation, each one of us has been affected yeah. and we really need to take this as a very serious matter. All right. Yeah. Dr. Chibanzi, I'll come to you. And cancer is the third leading killer disease in Kenya, but 70 to 80 percent of it is diagnosed late. What is the missing gap? You're a health practitioner and you know this. Um, thank you, and first and foremost, um, we'd like to offer our condolences to the family of the late Dr. J. Slaboso, the people of Womet County and the country at large. Um, indeed, for us as KMPDU, she was uh, very supportive of us as the union. Um, I think late in February, we did have, we, we were part of the uh, stakeholders were involved in her county when she was launching um, the NHIF package for her residents and uh, it's indeed a tragic loss she was such a visionary leader and um, Kenya is indeed at loss as we speak today um, the question you're asking is <coughs> question you're asking is uh, it's diagnosed late so in as much as we let me start by saying that as much as we do want to declare it a national disaster First, let us also agree that declaring it a national disaster is not enough in itself. We need to have a strategic way of uh, handling these uh, rising cases of cancer and the epidemic that we are currently facing in the country. From human resources for health, we need to train more um, of our health practitioners to be able to deal with this. We need to change our approach to the entire um, 
health care system. Yeah. It's not just cancer, but it needs a holistic approach of the system, right from the primary level of health care all the way up to the tertiary level of health care. Yeah. And until we systematically and strategically embark on that, then declaring it as a national disaster is not going to be enough in um, sorting this issue. As diagnosis being let, yeah. um, there's so many factors that um, come into play. One is the index of suspicion. And how does cancer present? And you'd find that at some point, cancer presents just like any other normal illness. Yeah. So that, that in itself becomes a diagnostic challenge. Two, um, the level of uh, diagnostic um, technology that we have in the country. Yeah. And the affordability. And remember also that our patients in Kenya, for those of us who actually work in the public healthcare system, 80% are cash paying. Mm. So you'd see a patient, you might have the high index of suspicion, yeah. but when you do send the patient for the test, unfortunately they're unable to afford it, and they can go back home because then it becomes a matter of, do I go for the test or do I look at my family and food? Yeah. And as a result, they'll go back home because they're saying, fine, I've been given a drug for now. Then they'll come in back much later when the disease is advanced. Okay. So that is also a big challenge. And because of that, it's, it's time that universal health coverage, financial protection for the entire country, okay. for the populace. Hold that thought. We'll come into the details of UHC. Yeah. But Dr. Wamai, there's, there's this notion that Kenyans are not going for early checkups. But the citizen has been running a series of waiting on health. It takes you at least 10 hours just to see a medical doctor. And Tibanzi is saying that sometimes the, the manifestation of cancer comes as any other ordinary disease. If I'm not that unwell, will I wait for 10 hours just to see a medical doctor? Isn't it, isn't it a, a, an inspiration for me to just go home and say it's just a headache, I'll just go home until it becomes something serious? What do we need to fix in our systems? I think so, so much in Kenya needs to be fixed and I'm glad that, um, that the previous speakers have talked about the lack of a legal infrastructure or if it's there, it, it, it still needs so much work and of course a systemic, a holistic change in Kenya's health infrastructure and not just the government but also the doctors and I'm happy that uh, KPMDU is here. So. Part of the reason I believe that people have to wait for hours, our doctors apply, uh, who are employed in the public health care system are most of the time uh, not available. And I know there are so many challenges that they face. Even doctors are not uh, given the support they need uh, in, terms of, in terms of equipment and in terms of just su uh, support that the government needs to invest. But if you look at cancer, it's still a politically invisible disease. And it's really sad because at this point in time, and I would also actually first want to give condolences to the woman who died, the one who had gone to Kenyatta, and she didn't have, was it 2,000 shillings? 1,900. Yes, less than 2,000 shillings. And she died because of cervical cancer. And that's an ordinary woman and who, so, it is urgent and of course I give condolences to uh, the, the family of uh, uh, Dr. Laboso. We have lost a woman governor, now we only have two, which is really sad. And of course, uh, Doc, uh, Ken Okos, who was one of the most vibrant members of parliament. And so you can see we are losing people at their prime. And if we don't watch out, if we, if we continue making cancer a politically invisible disease, so it means it is under-emphasized, under-researched, and under-treated. Yeah. And there are so many researchers, even in Kenya right now, there's uh, like one of the leading researchers, Dr. Joki Maina, here at the University of Nairobi. We've created a research hub right yeah. now. The University of Nairobi is one of the research hubs for the African universities. Is parliament speaking to these researchers? There is Professor Mulemi, who has been researching who wrote actually an ethnography of cancer, spent almost a year in Kenyatta National Hospital in the wards. So the researchers are there, but they also feel unsupported okay. by the government. And then everybody's not speaking to, to, we're not speaking to each other, the politicians, we are not, uh, are not speaking to researchers, researchers are not in the doctors. Okay. And so, so much work needs to be done. All right. And um, 
I, 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 I'm happy at least we're having this conversation. Okay, let's bring in Mashirima Makapombe here, who's with some of the people who are cancer survivors. Mashirima? Na Mudoni Mati, ambaye anahisi kuwa haya majadiliano uwa ya natokea wakati ambapo kuna vifu ambavyo vimefuatana. Mudoni, suwamo utuleze tu experience yako, ilikuwaje na kwanini unahisi kuwa hili suwala halijadiliwi kutosha? Um... My name is Mudoni Mata, founder of the Cancer Cafe, and I am a cancer survivor myself. And uh, I just take the opportunity to send condolences, but also ask the media, why is it that only the only time we get to hear these stories is when somebody passes on, or when there's somebody worth media to actually have the stories being done? Why don't you not have cases of the media personalities using up the mechanism that they have to actually put the information out there of the success stories of systems that actually do work instead of always having just the doom and the gloom and putting guys together when something major happens how was your journey like my journey you was um did the system work for you the system does work okay. i still get my medication on nhif i still get to see the local doctors i still get to get my treatment locally okay. and i'm three years now in remission so the system does have parts of it that does work it's not perfect but we need to highlight those little those little flames okay. so that eventually they end up becoming a big bonfire that actually caters for this rather than the scare of one person and that's a story that we tell over and over again was it expensive because that is what people complain about it is expensive this. yeah but that's why you also have systems within the government within the ministry within the public sector that caters for that but so many people do not know that NHIF has super cover. They only know about the 2,000 shillings, which is a default that everybody gets. Okay. But once they get to understand that they can access super cover that caters to up to 80% of your medical treatment, then you don't have to sell your shamba, you don't have to sell your cow to be able to get that treatment. Okay. Hey, I'm Ruth. Uh, I'm five years cancer survivor. I got diagnosed back on 2015. But first, I went to a local hospital where I did my first biopsy. But can you imagine unafanya biopsy but daktari anakupatia iyo biopsy wende nayo nyumbani? You see? Uh, then I came to another hospital, still a local hospital, but uh, I didn't get oncology. I got a doctor, but unona, the first time you got diagnosed with cancer, you don't know what is cancer. So the second time, I got a doctor, so um, I got amputated to, due to doctor's negligence. Yeah. And when I got amputated, the doctor didn't even tell me, like, you have to do this after amputation, you have to do this after amputation, then it is spreaded. You see, why do doctors do that? If you know you cannot handle cancer, why, why treat cancer and, if you, and you cannot handle it? Why? You see? Awali umesema kuwa ulipatiwa ripoti yako ya biopsi wende nayo nyumbani. Nikuwa huku welezwa, ilikuwa na semaji. After, after theater, nilipewa that thing, that, that, that ka thing, yenye nilitorewa, ya. Yeah. Nika apatiwa, nika indanayo nyumbani. The doctor haku niambia ata, you are supposed to take it in laboratory or wherever you are supposed to take it, you see? It's just a local hospital. Then after that, I didn't have enough money, like me in the hospital, yeah, private. I went uh, to another local hospital, whereby I didn't have enough money. You see? So, Dr. Ali nisaidia tu penye angeweza kunisaidia by that time. Na aka nikatamgu without even knowing, like, anipe, aniambia nime katamgu, you do this. And when I took my, after after it spreaded, I took my x-rays, yamgu na all those things. Um, then I, uh, the doctor that I found in Aga told me that I was not supposed to be amputated because the leg, haikuwa imeguza sana ata bone. I was not supposed to be amputated. So if Tungepata in like uh, Tupate cancer is declared national disaster, to where like unenda hospital, haina pesa mingi, nini nini, tuneza kuwa hatu, okay, things like kuamputatiwa, you are not supposed to be amputated, has zinge kuwa zina happen. Sure.
labda daktari unaweza kujibu ile swali daktari anaweza kufanya mambo kama yale ambayo Ruth ameeleza hapa anastahili kufanya hivyo nimemsikiza uh, Ruth na pole sana um, unajua katika matibabu kuweza kuwa na tofauti za vile njia itakayotumika daktari alimuona labda aliamua kufanya amputation kwa sababu alikuwa ameangalia labda akiacha inaweza kusambaa ikashika mguu mzima unaelewa kwa hiyo utapata daktari mwingine baadaye akwambie labda usinge kuwa umefanyiwa kwa hiyo hivyo ni vitu ambavyo hutokea in treatment you'd say there are treatment options and sometimes a doctor decides to take this treatment option based on the evidence based on what they've seen in the patient so at this point in time i cannot I, and i don't think there's any doctor in this country who has gone undergone training who will treat a patient to harm a patient all doctors do it in the best interest of the patient and sometimes the missing link that I'll, I'll acknowledge could be communication that probably the patient did not get to understand really well what the doctor was trying to aim at but in reality i don't think there is any doctor and i'm very confident because i'm one of them and i work with them and i know them there's none who will take an action to harm a patient i see, I see dr wamai shaking her head <laughs> she got amputated for what she calls negligence for she's calling it negligence dr wamai what do you, what do you think of it what do you, dr moshonda just said first i'd like to say pole pole sana to to the speaker um i mean yes i know most doctors want the best and to do the best but one of the things we have to acknowledge in Kenya medicine has been corporatized this is a public good but right from i think the way we train our doctors even just the way high school, in high school what happens how do you do medicine because you got an a yeah so and and not because not because this is maybe your passion but also it's because of the market there's high level of unemployment and so and then we've corporatized medicine as a country and so as much as i know the doctors want to do the right thing there's also those who are driven by i want to make money I've, i remember one time going to take somebody to see a doctor who did not deserve surgery at all and that doctor already started booking uh, the theater for this person thank god we went for a second and a third opinion so as much as i know they want to do good we many of them it's about making money i mean a, a, i i can i believe a few of them so they are not also otherwise why do we have so many cases of negligence <laughs> but all of us have been also agrees to that then no, i'll come can I to speak you. yeah you'll get a right of reply okay. um i just want my bit to partially agree with what actaria said because we have a lot of um Which our people jibanzi or wamai wamai okay <laughs> And I think one of the reasons, and I said we want to meet even the training institution, is one of the, or what the question we asked, why did you become a doctor in the first place? Um, when I was following the story on the waiting time and everything else, we handle, we get our patients being handled differently by different doctors. There are some who are there to serve from the heart. They will go an extra mile. If they are not sure, they would seek for a second or third opinion. Yeah. And then you are just, you know, amputating somebody's leg. It's just, just something that you can be able to take back. And I think by the time you're making that decision, you must be very sure that that's the right decision. And so we need, apart from just training our doctors, there's that the human part that we might, I don't know whether it can be trained on or people can be asked to reconsider. Don't just go because you want to become a doctor or you want to become a nurse because you think that's where the money is. But it should come from serving in the first place and i think that's the missing link okay so i i would i'll plead and i again want to say very sorry to ruth that um if a doctor is not sure it is important for him or her to seek for a second and even a third opinion it doesn't hurt okay yeah you need to give a right response yes i do and first i'd uh, like to start by saying this um i don't think she's right and i'll deny it first she said doctors are not available in the facilities now every day every day up until this moment it's right now 10:30 the doctors in public facilities treating kenyans and i know that myself so when you say doctors are not available i'd i'd i'd, um, I'd ask for evidence from her to show us and, and sorry to say but we've driven a narrative in this country that doctors are always the scapegoats so we forgot about the system 
we focus on the doctors. So you say, believe the system doesn't work? It's and a broken and system. The and it's system not is broken. Thank system. you for using the word. The system is broken, and you need an audit of the system to fix it completely. That does not mean that the doctors are not part of the system. They are part of the system. Let me ask you, um, Trevor, let me just put it out there. These standard eight people's case, you see, um, people who pass the exams get as. When you go and you uh, interview them, most of them will tell you either become, want to become a doctor or an engineer. And most of them do not do it out of um, the love for money. I don't believe so. But if you're talking about commercialization of health, which is talking about corporatization of health, it's not a Kenyan phenomenon, it's a global phenomenon. And this is where we've literally killed the public healthcare system and made the private healthcare system an alternative. And as a result of that, it becomes about money. I can tell you for sure, private hospitals are not about um, service. They're about, these are corporates. It's about profits and business. And the doctor gets involved there. There are so doctors who work in private facilities. Then you're back to the argument that they had earlier on, that it's been commercialized. Actually, I, and I, it's, I would it's like the system. to... Yeah. And let okay. me finish, yeah? Yeah. Let me finish. There, there are Briefly. hospitals in this country, yeah. private hospitals, let me say it. A patient will walk in, you'd want to help as a doctor. I'll not mention the hospitals for the, for the sake of this discussion. And you'll be told, unless that patient has money and paid, you are not allowed to touch that patient. I've witnessed this myself. I've talked to my colleagues of and they have to sit back and watch a patient. I know a radiologist who resigned because a patient came, she could not, she was not allowed to okay. undertake the necessary investigation because the patient could not pay. And she said, I can't handle this. And she, she resigned from the public, okay. private facility. All right. I think what, what Kenyans are suffering from is um, lack of information. Because in our constitution on the Bill of Rights, Every Kenyan, when you walk to any facility, whether it's a private facility or a, a, a public facility, you have a right to be attended to. But I think because we don't have many people who have gone to sue these institutions, then everybody is quiet. And I've seen instances and cases where when the public complain yes. or people go on social media, we quickly see facilities actually calling the family, doing the waiver of the bills and saying we're going to take care of this and quickly doing the cover up. Yes. And I think it's a high time Kenyans should know their rights. What is in the constitution, even um, if you look at the Health Act, that every Kenyan should work in any facility. First priority, receive yes. treatment, then the issue of money comes in. Okay. I, I have one Dr. Nikal who is in my committee who keeps on referring to um, the 70s or early 80s where um, the patients would be referred from actually private facilities to public facilities yeah. because then the public facilities, they were working. But then we find, um, and this is out of now my short experience being the chair of health, yeah. that when people become permanent and pensionable in our public facilities, yeah. they relax. Look at the referral hospitals, our main referral hospitals that we have in this nation. We have doctors on call. We have, I don't know, the first one, the, the second one, the third one. And the main one will be called in as a fourth, you know. But that person is on, on, on payroll. Yes. They are supposed to be on duty. But then when you walk into Kenyatta, you'll find the, the students who are there. Then you'll find a second doctor. Then you'll find the main doctor actually would be fourth on call. Okay. And so it is important that we take our work seriously. He says, yes, our, a lot of our students in KCSE would say, I would want to become a doctor. But what is the driving, um, what is the factor? Yeah. You right. know, um, the, the whole thing, and yeah. I, 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 I happen to be in a funeral where one of the, because the, uh, the, peop, uh, the preacher said, oh. we were told to so make wabidi, to part a in Zuri. So it's just for work. Okay. But we need to change even our education system where we start training our own children yeah. to get uh, to study hard for service. All right. You know, yes. to be selfless okay. first. Right. Yes. And I it's think that is the gap that we are having, okay. not only in the health sector, but yeah. in all the yeah. other yeah. sectors. Right. People are not yeah. there to serve. No, no, no. Just, <laughs> just one point. <laughs> just one line, because <laughs> Bashiri <laughs> needs to come in as well. <laughs> ndio tutakupatia nafasi baadaye kidogo ili tuweze pia kusikia kutoka huko upande mwingine tuwapatie wengine nafasi ya kuzungumza tutapumzika kidogo tu kisha tutakaporejea nitakuwa napatia nafasi watu ambao wanahisi kuwa pia wagonjwa wana tabia mbaya usiondoke bila wagonjwa bila wagonjwa wana tabia mbaya wagonjwa pia wana tabia mbaya